heard from a teacher who had heard from another teacher who had gotten an email about somebody who had heard something at a meeting where it was actually possible for you to get in trouble for using videos in the classroom. I would like to have been able to know, well, what are my rights here? Uh, sometimes I had an awareness that I might have been doing something I shouldn't have been doing, but I was able to just kind of push it out of the way. Um, and fortunately, I didn't get those fingers slapped, but, but teachers are. A teacher that uses his guidelines may have very good intentions, uh, but in fact, what they end up doing, whether they're aware of it or not, is they're relinquishing their, their opportunities under the law. The opportunities under fair use are flexible so that we can adapt the standard of fair use to meet changing needs, changing technologies, changing materials, changing circumstances. The so-called fair use guidelines on topics like photocopying and off-air taping are rigid, conservative, outmoded interpretations of the law, not the law itself. They no longer reflect the realities of the classroom, if they ever did. Today, they are strangling educational practice rather than enabling it. The specific exceptions that copyright law provides for teaching are too few and too narrow to cover many common and important educational practices. So to do their best work, teachers also need fair use. Documentary filmmakers defined what they meant by fair use. And now, using their code of best practices, they are able not only to lower their costs, but to make better work. What constitutes fair use depends on the situation. Broadcasters and journalists understand how the doctrine applies to them, and so do documentary filmmakers. Now the media literacy community is figuring it out, too. They've come together to create what teachers really need, not a rule book, but a code of best practices to guide them and their students in making their own wise decisions. Media literacy organizations banded together to explore what their members think is fair. They met over the course of a year in cities like Philadelphia, St. Louis, Chicago, Boston, Austin, Texas, San Francisco, Columbia, South Carolina, Ithaca, New York, and New York City to create the code of best practices in fair use for media literacy education. Fair use allows you to use copyrighted material without permission or payment when the benefit to society outweighs the cost to the copyright owner. Fair use helps to prevent copyright from becoming a charter for private censorship. Fair use is flexible and dynamic. It favors transformative uses, those which add content to and repurpose copyrighted material, and it's the law, part of the Copyright Act of 1976. teacher, as a student in a media class, as someone who had a teacher who was a student in a media class, if you know someone who looks like a teacher, it doesn't matter, <laughs> go to them, talk to them, talk about fair use, talk about why it's so important, talk about what kinds of things can be used in the classroom, should be used in the classroom. If it's not a part of fair use, why isn't it a part of fair use? Educators need to be able to claim their right to use fair use, and we need to teach it to our students. In an increasingly copyrighted world, fair use makes it possible to develop critical thinking and communication skills that are essential for participation in 21st century life.